Hello and welcome to this film which is all about electron configurations and it's the last of the four films about high level atomic structure. Um, it follows on from the film about orbitals and subshells and shells and if that film left you feeling a little bit confused then hopefully this film will put those things into a bit more context and, and help you understand what we mean by those things. Um, Hopefully by the end of this film you'll know the rules that we use when we're deciding electron configurations for atoms and you'll be able to carry out some simple examples using these rules and understand how electron configurations can be represented. Okay, here are the rules that electrons obey. Um, the Aufbau principle, first of all, says that if I start giving um, and atom electrons. Those electrons will first of all go into the lowest energy orbitals that they can. Okay. The Pauli exclusion principle is stated in lots and lots of different ways but um, it basically says that no two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers which we looked at in the last film. This is like saying that no two electrons can have exactly the same spin in the same orbital in the same subshell of the same shell. Okay. And there's Hunt's rule, which says that electrons won't pair up, their spins won't pair up in an orbital unless they absolutely have to. And we'll see what we mean by unless they have to, and we'll put these rules into a bit more context by doing some examples using them. Okay, first of all, we need to remember something about the energy of orbitals. And it's good if you can remember up to about 5s. Okay, so... Um, you don't have to remember the, energy, the relative energies of every single orbital out there. It's important to realize that every atom has every one of these orbitals in it available, but not every atom has filled all of them or, or any of them. Okay, So we need to know the relative energies of all these orbitals here. This diagram represents each orbital as a box. So if we look at the first shell here, so that's principal quantum number one, you can see that there is one subshell in that shell, it's called the S subshell, and there's one orbital in that S subshell. You might remember that MS, the spin quantum number, can take values of minus a half or plus a half. That means that an electron that is going into one of these orbitals can be spinning one way or the other. Okay, so we represent the spin of electrons by saying what direction the arrows pointing in. Okay, so each arrow in these boxes is going to be an electron in an orbital. Okay, 1s has a lower energy than 2s, which is lower than 2p. You can see that all the orbitals in 2p have the same energy. They're called degenerate. Their energy is lower than the energy of a 3s orbital, which is lower than the 3, 3p orbitals. And if you look in the third shell now, we've got not only s and P, but we've also got the D subshell that's got five orbitals in it. They've all got exactly the same energy as one another, and they've got almost the same energy as 4s, but not quite. 4s is a little bit lower, but annoyingly, I suppose, the, uh, the energy of the D and F orbitals can change depending on whether they've got electrons in them or not which means that the relative energies of the S and D orbitals can actually reverse when there's electrons in here. But we'll worry about that a bit more later when we look at the electron configurations of transition metal ions. OK, let's try practicing writing some electron configurations and using the rules that we saw earlier. Carbon is the sixth element in the periodic table, so it's got six electrons. OK. It's got all these orbitals available, just like every other atom, but the lowest possible orbital that I could put an electron into is 1s. Where's the second electron going to go? Well, it would rather not pair up, according to Hund's rule, but there's an energy barrier here, a fairly big one, so it's got no choice, it's going to have to go in there. I can't draw it pointing the same way, because the Pauli exclusion principle says that it can't have the same spin in the same orbital, these two electrons, OK? Next electron is going to go into 2s. Again, there's an energy barrier here that stops me going, oh, well, I don't want to be paired up. I'm just going to have to swallow it and pair up in there because the energy difference here is too big. I've used four electrons. 
Now I've got orbitals that are all the same energy, so I can choose as an electron, if I'm blessed with, <laughs> with choice, um, to not pair up, so I'm going into a different orbital. So I might be in one, one might be in Px, one might be in Py. When I'm writing the electron configuration, I don't have to state that they're in different orbitals. I just have to say that there are two electrons in 1s, so I write something that looks like 1s squared, but it's said 1s2. There's two in the 2s, and there's two in 2p, so 2p2. Okay, so carbon has that electron configuration, right? If I turned it into a carbon 2 plus ion, maybe, if I imagine such a thing, then I'd be losing electrons from the highest energy orbital and it would be 1s2, 2s2. Because when I remove electrons, I remove the highest energy ones first. But anyway, here is the electron configuration for carbon. Okay, I can also see that from the periodic table, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Let's move on to a slightly more complex one, which is sulfur, and that is number 16, so there are 16 electrons. We can see that by the time we've got to sulfur, we've got the same we've got at least as many electrons as neon had. So that's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Right? So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. What some people do, which is not to be encouraged, is to abbreviate this later on, but we'll see how that works in just a moment. I've now got another, how many have I used? I've used 10, so I've got another 6 electrons. The next one's got to go into the lowest possible energy orbital. There's an energy jump here, so we can't avoid pairing up the spins there. We've now used 12, we've got 4 left. They can avoid pairing the first 3 here, because they've got 3 different orbitals each with the same energy, but the fourth one's got no choice, it's going to have to pair up. It doesn't matter which of those it pairs up in, really. Okay. Now, we can see here that this is like having, but we're going to not encourage you to do this, unless you're told specifically in the question that you can, you've got the same electron configuration as neon, right? Neon's up to here, but you've also got 3s2, 2 in 3s, and 4 in 3p. But really and truly, unless we've been told specifically in the question that we can use that shortcut, we ought to write this out as 1s2, 2s2, 3s, 2p6, sorry, 3s2, and 3p4. And if we made, let's say, a sulfide ion, s2 minus, then that would turn into 3p6. Okay, so giving extra electrons, we're going to change the electron configuration of the atom. Anyway, let's move on and do um, an atom that does use these orbitals here that we talked about earlier, s and 3, 4s and 3d, that have very, very similar energies. Okay, as before, we can kind of think about this as well. We've got to here, we've got 21 electrons, so we've got at least as far as argon, so let's put in what argon's got. That's everything. 1s2 filled, 2s is filled, 2p is filled, 3s is filled, and 3p is also filled. So we'll put two electrons into each and every one of those orbitals, which remember we're representing as boxes on this diagram. Sometimes you're asked to draw these diagrams, um, Sometimes you're not, um, but as I say, it's important that you can picture this diagram so that you know how many orbitals are actually filled or partially filled. Now, what have we got left? We've used 18 electrons. Scandium goes, right, well, I've got to put one in 4s. 3d is very, very close in energy, but there is a bit of a jump. So for the time being, I'm going to put two electrons in there, and I'm going to put one in 3d. Now, Writing the electron configuration can be done in a number of different ways. You can use the shortcut, which we're not encouraging, so I'm not going to write it on the page this time. But it's definitely 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. And here's where the difference can be. You can either now say 4s2, 3d1, or you can keep all the threes together and write it as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d1, 
and then 4s2. It doesn't really matter too much which way of which one of those you choose. This one is a little bit more useful in some ways because it helps you remember that when scandium starts losing electrons, it loses its 4s electrons first. And that's because as soon as you put electrons into a 3d orbital, their energy drops slightly and 4s becomes a slightly higher energy orbital. Okay? But we'll worry about that a bit more later when we look at the electron configurations of transition metal ions. And that will be in the periodicity topic. Right, here's a little quirk. And there's two quirks in the third shell. They're chromium and copper. And these are kind of an illustration of Hunt's rule, uh, which kind of well it's hard to sort of see coming really but you need to remember them okay now chromium is element 24 so there's 24 electrons and we've got as far as calcium which had 20 calcium is 1s2 so it's s over here so it's 4s2 is filled so we'll go and fill up everything up to 4s2 except the funny thing is here that there is some stability to be had by having a half full D subshell. So I could put 2 into 4s, that would leave me with 4 to put into 3d, so I could put 4 electrons into 4, well, 1 into each of 4 of these orbitals. But by having a half full D subshell, chromium becomes a bit more stable, so it actually just puts 1 electron in 4s and then it's got five to put in its D subshell and it has a half full shell there and that's a little bit more stable so whereas we might expect it to be 4s2 3d4 it actually becomes 4s1 3d5 so 1s2 2s2 3 oh god keep forgetting 2p 2p6 3s2 3p6 4s1 3d5 or 3d5 4s1 whichever way you prefer to write it okay there's another quirk when you come up to copper which you might expect to be 4s2 3d9 but it's actually 4s1 3d10 so remember those two little quirks now on a similar note you might remember that when we were looking at the first ionization energies before we went along the second period we went from lithium to beryllium and then there was a little dip when we came to boron before we went up again now let's see why that is okay beryllium's got four electrons boron has five we've just been talking about the stability of having full or half full subshells okay and we were looking at this and we were looking at this graph in the previous film and suggesting that maybe these dips are telling us something about the stability of the subshells within a shell. Okay, if I had four electrons, like beryllium, I'd have a full subshell. If I have five electrons, like boron, I've got a partially full subshell. So because this full subshell that beryllium has gives it a bit of stability, it's easier to remove electrons from boron than it is from beryllium because you're removing something from a subshell that isn't particularly stable. Similarly, we saw a dip between nitrogen and oxygen. So we went from boron to carbon to nitrogen, and then there was a dip, and we got to oxygen. Okay, let's explain that one if we can. Well, nitrogen has seven electrons, oxygen has eight. Let's put seven electrons into here, four. We'll put the next three into different orbitals within the P subshell because we're going to avoid spin pairing. We can do that because they've all got the same energy. Oxygen's eighth electron would have to pair up here, which, remember, electrons don't particularly want to do. So it's a bit less stable than having this half full subshell. Okay? So that's why nitrogen has a slightly more stable electron configuration than oxygen because it's got a half full subshell, which oxygen can get by losing one electron, but it doesn't have. Okay, last thing I'm going to say in this film is about what block an element is in. This has to do 
with what your highest energy occupied orbitals are. Okay, so if, for example, I was um, carbon with uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, my highest occupied subshell is a p subshell, so I'm a p block element. Okay, if my highest occupied subshell is a d subshell, then I'd be a d block element and I'd be found in the d block. Okay. Um, bear in mind, as I said earlier, all atoms have all these subshells available. Okay, what we're talking about is not what subshells do you have, but what subshell is your highest energy electron in when you're deciding what block an element is in. Whew, okay, that's uh, that seemed like quite a lot. Hopefully, it hasn't gone on too long, um, but. Um, hopefully you now know the rules that we use when deciding electron configurations. Remember, you don't need to state the rules, you just need to be able to use them. And you've uh, understood the examples that we've gone through. As usual, if you've got any questions, if there's any confusion, or if you want to uh, make any kind of comment, then feel free to put that on YouTube or to come and see me uh, when you get some time to do that.